Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and welcome back to This Hijabi Life, a show about Muslim women, modest fashion, and the modern world. My name is Hakima, and today we're going to be talking more about the entrepreneurship journey that a lot of Muslim women go into in the hijab fashion industry. A lot of times these businesses are considered side hustles, something that you do on the side. And the connotation is that they're not really bringing in a lot of money. But the hijab fashion industry is booming, it is lucrative, and there are businesses that have reached the million dollar level. One such business is Wall Chic. And today we have the owner of Wall Chic, Marwa Adardiri, and she is here to talk about her brand, Wall Chic, as well as Thrive Entrepreneurship Academy, where she mentors small business owners to get to her level and become a million dollar business as well. So welcome, Marwa. Um, hi, Hakima. I'm so happy to be here today. <laughs> I'm happy that you're here as well. So, a lot, of, a lot of times, you know, who you are today as a woman reflects who you used to be as a child. We know that you're a million dollar business owner, that you're into hijab fashion, but who you were as a child often inspires the journey. So, I wanted to start off with talking about who you are. Um, before the million dollar business? Okay, so um, I guess we'll start from my parents. They left Egypt and came to Canada. They settled in Toronto. Um, my mom actually did engineering in Egypt. She was like one of the only women in her class. But when she came to Canada, both her and my father didn't really come with anything. And um, she decided instead of going into the workforce and you know trying to pursue a career that she knew she'd be able to acquire, she said, I'd rather focus on raising my children um, because I wanna make sure I do a good job raising them. I'd have, um, you know, if it was about the money, I'd have four money makers instead of one being herself and being absent from our lives. So um, I had a very uh, strong mother, she's a, uh, a bit aggressive in her approach, but it's all comes from a place of love and care. So the neighborhood I grew up in wasn't like, it's probably, it's the bottom in terms of uh, socioeconomic status. So um, it came with a lot of challenges. Um, anybody who comes from a similar area would understand, but I did have a lot of care in the home. So I feel like some of those challenges outside the home helped uh, build me into the person I am now. It's a lot of learning. But in school, I was one of those people who pretty much participated in everything. I would join every team, whether I was good at the sport or not. Um, I ran for politics in elementary school. Mm -hmm. I was pretty active. I do drama class. I did a bit of everything. Um, and that was, again, encouraged by my mother. She encouraged me to participate in everything, um, just you know, to get I guess to try to make me enjoy life, but also so that I could acquire all these skills and experiences. Um, so yeah, it's funny you, you talk about childhood. I, I recently looked at my grade eight yearbook and um, I was looking at, the, there's a section where people say, what are you gonna be when you grow up? And you have to answer. Mm -hmm. And like a lot of my friends are saying model, actress. Um, the guys were like rapper, basketball player. And then mine said, I don't know what I'm going to become, but I'm going to make huge bucks. <laughs> that Seriously? was basically it. Yeah, I was shocked to see that. I said, I don't know what I'm going to become, but I'm going to be making huge bucks. Just kidding. <laughs> oh, oh, but not the just yeah. kidding part, because it actually happened. <laughs> well, clearly I wasn't, but I have, to, I, have to, I have to say so. You know, I didn't want to come off that way, but yeah. I don't know. I didn't even know that I liked money. I just knew it was a good thing. But mm -hmm. I, I, it wasn't just kidding, because honestly, we weren't socialized to become rich or to make exactly. a lot of money. We weren't socialized. Yeah. So it was yeah. kind of a joke. I just knew, hey, it's a good thing. Everybody's trying to become a celebrity basketball player. It must be because of the money and the fame. So yeah. I just was like, I don't know what I'm going to be, but I'm going to I'm going to make it. But it, yeah, it's going to it's going to make you money. And that's amazing because you can tell that even as young as eighth grade, you mm -hmm. had that inside of you, you know, mm -hmm. that whatever was going to be your path, you were going to be successful mm -hmm. at it, inshallah. So mm -hmm. how did that, okay, so now you're, you're doing drama, you're doing sports, you're doing a whole bunch of stuff, you're multi-talented. 
how did it kind of focus onto fashion with Wall Chic? Oh, I'm still not a fashion person. So hmm. it was never, it was never about fashion for me. I realized, well, I didn't realize I am an entrepreneur. So for me, it's, it was just about um, finding a space that would work for me and work for others. So I was actively searching for what I would pursue. And it's not, I, it, it didn't, it wasn't bred out of a, of, of a love for, out of a love for fashion. It was mm -hmm. more of a need that the community needed. I found a gap in the market and I was like, somebody needs to fill in this gap. And again, that business model, the whole online business model, I found it as a, I found it, it was an opportunity to allow me to live the lifestyle I wanted. So I got into the, into business yes i wanted to make more money but also because i wanted to do something more fulfilling and i actually wanted to work less and i wanted to work from home and work flexible hours because i was thinking about being a mother so my my why as they say or the reason why i got into business was not for the money it was so that i could make an income while being home with my son um mm -hmm. so i just wanted a flexible lifestyle so when I tried other businesses, I'd have to be on the phone talking to people. And I was like, this isn't going to work with a baby crying in the background. But once I entered into the online space, I found a gap in the market. I found that I'd be able to relate to the women I'm serving and that I wouldn't have to be on the phone. I would just be on emails. You wouldn't know what's going on in the background. I was like, okay, this business could suit my lifestyle. And if I want to travel, as long as there was an internet signal, I'd be able to run my business. So it wasn't bred out of a love for fashion. Rather, it was in an opportunity and after you know trying other things i realized that this opportunity would suit my lifestyle and support my why yeah yeah i love that because i think it relates to a lot of women who go into creating something in the hijab fashion space because mm -hmm. there was this tremendous gap and i think there still is there's still a huge gap even with businesses like yours filling in those gaps, there's still so much more to be done. So I want to mm -hmm. know if if Wall Chic started any time around 2013, 2016, when did 2014, Wall Chic start? End of 2014. I think that that like that range from like 2012 to 2016, it start it sparked a lot of businesses to open up because that gap was identified and so many entrepreneurs and women with bright ideas and a lot of determination and mo motivation, they could not only use that motivation and determination to establish a business, but also could relate directly to the experience of their customer, exactly. right? So if you're, you're wearing the hijab, you know that a leather hijab is not gonna work. <laughs> you know, and you know that, so you can sell to your customer a lot more successfully than someone who's just like, oh, there's a gap over there. I've never worn a hijab. I don't live 100%. a Muslim life. I'm not a, I'm not a mother. I don't have, you know, I don't have this five daily prayers. We'll do all these things like we have to do. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and so they're the ones that might try to fill our gap. And then we look at them and we're like, a leather hijab? Is that what you want? You know, like they're the ones that would create something terrible like that. And yep. so I think that combination of you relating to it, having, you know, that seed inside of you that said you want to make money, you know, you want it to be mm -hmm. successful. And then being in that prime, that prime time, I'm telling you so many businesses started in that time. Um, I think that th those were the beginning beginnings of something absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of absolutely beautiful, when I'm scrolling through my feed, you know, social media, um, when I see a Voile Chic um, picture or video, usually you do uh, pictures. Um, I know it as Wall Chic before I even see the name Wall Chic. And I think that that's something that happened a long time ago. It seems like it's been consistent. And it's something that I think a lot of people kind of skip over. Oh, I'm just going to put my brand out there and hopefully I'll get some customers. But there's a whole marketing package and a look and feel that I think you've done so well for your brand. So how did you get started with like, you know, in 2014, when you're starting to introduce your brand, what are the things, the tenants of your brand that you wanted to say, okay, this will stay consistent. This is the look and feel. This is how I'm projecting myself 
into the world with this brand? So I actually did it the easy way, which is the way I teach. So number one, I always ask women who want to pursue a business if they're busy and they don't want to hate their business and they don't want their business to take over their life. I Step one is exactly what we just discussed, which is get into something that you're passionate about, that you can relate to, solve your own problem, right? And then solve that problem for other women like you, or look at a problem that you've once solved for yourself and you know create that that solution for other women the second thing is i instead of becoming a branding and marketing expert right away that can happen later i've become a lot better at marketing and branding and i can do things intentionally but i like i said i took the i took the easy path and like i said i teach the easy path as well which is to have your business be an extension of yourself so those values that you saw in the business or those colors that you saw in the business or the tone, um, the tone of the business, all of these things were, were pretty much me. They were an extension of me. So I didn't have to think too hard or do too much research. I was just authentic. And even though I didn't show up, I never showed myself. I never, uh, yeah, I never showed myself. I, this is actually extremely uncomfortable for me right now. Um, but what I did do is you can speak for your brand or you can have your brand speak for you. And I had my brand speak for me. And it's crazy how without even showing up, people actually start to know you and relate to you and feel like, for example, I would reach out to people every once in a while, say, why do you still buy from Volshik? Why do you, why do you come to Volshik over any other brand? And one lady told me, because I, I, I like the woman behind the brand. And I was like, that's cool because I've never met her. Um, I've never, you know, I've never spoken to her yet. They still can see or feel the woman behind the brand. And that's because everything you saw was an extension of me. Wow. That, that is very powerful. One reason why is because there's a lot of Muslim women who want to do a brand, but they don't want to show up in, like they don't want to be in front of the screen. They only want to be behind the screen. Mm -hmm. And they think that it, it'll it be hard to translate their brand and sell a product um, without showing up. And for like, especially today, 2024, mm -hmm. you, gotta, you have to make reels. You have to have some sense of humor. You have to, you have mm -hmm. to do these things. And that's in mm -hmm. quotations because you actually don't have to do these things. Mm -hmm. You don't have to show up you know, you're saying this is your first time showing up, um, you know, for an interview. Is it your mm -hmm. first time? Yes. And, and that's after. And, and that's and after. It, guys, everybody, it's only because Hakima asked me. I got the exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> I got the exclusive. I, I, was asked, I was asked before this. <laughs> and I declined. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Well, that's good. I feel special. But yeah. it's because so many women feel like, okay, you got to show up in front of the screen in order to be, you know, to have your brand be successful. And you absolutely don't. And she is an example of that. Um, I do think we have to go for a break and we'll be back to talk a little bit more about Wall Chic as well as your mentorship program or your academy, Thrive Entrepreneurship. So we'll be back after the break. Welcome back to This Hijabi Life. Today we're talking to Marwa Adardiri. She is the owner of Wal Sheik, as well as Thrive Entrepreneurship Academy. And we were just talking right before the break about some of the limitations that maybe Muslim women might put upon themselves where they don't wanna be in front of the screen um, in order to put their business out there. Um, or that another thing is that they don't want to ask for help. Um, and that's not just Muslim women. That is women in general, especially mothers. And the reason being, we tend to pile a lot on our plate and we think we can handle. And that's something that I do a lot. I haven't asked for help up until this year or last year of my business um, where I hired an intern. 
and it was life changing. And I was thinking, when was I supposed? I was supposed to do this a long time ago. <laughs> um, I needed support a long time ago with my business. Um, so I wanted to know, have you done this all by yourself? Like, are, are you a one woman team? And if not, at what point in your business did you start to ask for that support? Was it familial? Did you like hire external people? Uh, where did you spend your money to get that support? I would really love to know, you know, what the team looks like to get your business to the way it is right now. Okay, so yeah, I am like you. Um, naturally, you know, I watched my mother do it and I did it as well. The whole idea of I'm going to do everything myself, but because my why was to work less so that I could spend more time with my son, my future children, my family, I always told myself, if your business is not fulfilling your why you're not doing it properly. And mm -hmm. that was the standard. So I did want to grow. The whole point is to grow your business when you're in business. And I was taking on everything at the very beginning, which I do think is important at the very beginning so that you understand your business and all the different aspects of it. But there comes a point where it starts to grow. And if you don't outsource, if you don't hire and you don't get that help, you're going to stagnate the growth of your business because you can only do so much. Not only are you going to stagnate the growth of your business, you're also possibly going to become miserable because mm -hmm. again, now I'm in a position of putting my business before my children when the whole reason I got into business was that so that I could go out to the park with my son when I felt like it. Right. Yeah. So um, I would just stop and reflect. And a lot of the, the early reading I did, um, one of the books I read early on was called the four hour work week because I wanted, you know, a four hour work week, but it didn't turn out being a four hour work week, but I mean, that's the direction I wanted to head in to work less and achieve more. Um, so I did make a conscious effort to only do what I have to do and to understand what my strengths are and to make sure that I'm only going to do what I'm extremely good at and what I absolutely have to do. So anything else that I don't absolutely have to do because of those two reasons, someone else needs to do it. And this was a conscious push on my end. I have to sit down and reflect, outsource and hire. So at the very, very, very beginning, um, and I did have some, I, I went to the school for social entrepreneurs in 2012, two years before that. So I did, enter a mentorship based uh, entrepreneurship program. So I heard a lot of uh, key points of advice while I was in that um, in that environment from other successful entrepreneurs. And there were things like collaboration is key, you know, persistence is key. And I would just pick out these key messages. But one of those messages was know when to move on. So this is in your career. This is in life. And this is in business. Um, so the early, early days, I was packing my first few orders, then, you know, more orders started coming in and I had the little one and I was, you know, on my way, you know, pregnant with the second one, we were getting to that point. So my husband was helping me pack those because naturally he's there and we have orders and we got to ship them out. So it's whoever's around and that's who was around me. So we'd be packing these orders together. Um, it got to the point I was living in a condo and it got to the point where there was a shipment that came in, which were 18 big boxes. Oh and gosh. people were kind of like the concierge was looking at these boxes and was like, this is kind of wild. Uh, it's, yeah. it's a big order, kind of starting to look like a commercial order in a residential uh, condo. Um, <laughs> and so at the time, you know, there's, there's the work we put in and the things we do, but then there's those external forces. And of course, for me, it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where he kind of does things. Sometimes they come in the form of inconvenience, but they're actually a gift in disguise. So my husband actually had to travel um, for a month at that point. And I was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? We have so many orders to pack. Uh, and then he was like, I don't know, can you just hold it down until I'm back? Because he really didn't want to let me down. But mm -hmm. then I thought about it. I said, this is it. No one to move on. This is time. It's time to move yeah. on. We should not be packing all these orders. It's just that feeling of not being able to let go and doing everything yourself, like you said, which is yeah. we're ingrained. It's, in that, it's ingrained in our mind to operate in this way. So then I just said, 
it's time to move on. I need to outsource shipping. Um, and he was like, no, no, no. Cause he felt like I was only doing it cause he was, you know, letting me down. And I was like, no, 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 you're not letting me down. I have to do this. You know, this is something I have to do. I knew I had to do it. It just, I didn't know how to do it. Cause it's uncomfortable. Change is uncomfortable. Taking things to the next level is uncomfortable. So I was like, this is good. It's a blessing in disguise. I have to outsource. Let me do the uncomfortable thing and move on to the next step. So that along with customer service, customer service, I originally got my, my cousin to do it. I just was like, you want some work? All right. I need some help. So I just looked around me and I got someone to help and I paid. So customer service and shipping, they are two repetitive tasks that we do every single day that I do not need to do that are taking up the bulk of my time. So those were the two first things I outsourced and it allowed me to focus more on uh, product development and marketing, which is what I still do till today. But even though I'm not the one implementing everything, I'm doing the strategizing or the thinking or the planning. Yeah. You're inspiring me. Like, I, I feel like I'm in your, this the space you were in back when you were in the condo and you received the boxes. <laughs> um, maybe not 18 just yet, but with my new product, I yeah. have a huge box right to my to my right <laughs> that has thousands of my products in it. And I know I'm gonna have to sit there packaging. And I have my, my two kids, my seven-year-old and my eight-year-old helping me to put the little labels on and they're feeling so like proud of themselves and it, it it's going to get to that point inshallah it gets to that point um where i'm going to have to outsource this and i think we talked a little bit what, about, what if you're already at that point right now i might be i might be <laughs> because it is very hard it is very hard especially i have a a, a young baby 16 months old so um yeah yeah, I'm 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 getting some like personal I, I, I inspiration. I think you're already at that point. Says, yeah. says the millionaire. I'm gonna listen. It's time to move on, Hakima. It's time to move on. Move on. I, I know all the signs. I know all the signs. You're there. Oh wow. Okay. All right. You'll I'm thank have to you'll that. you'll thank yourself. Trust me. You'll thank you'll, yourself and you'll get more done. Inshallah. Okay, so let's speed up to the point where you started to see that your business is okay so you had those 18 boxes now you're outsourcing the customer service and the shipping and now you're you're looking at the bank account and it's racking up how did it feel when you are getting to your first million and when did you feel what at what point did you feel like okay this is actually driving itself to that you know six seven seven figure level um like, how did that feel to like be able to get to that point? And then how did it feel to hit your first million? Um, so when you actually enjoy what you're doing and it's not a cause of like stress or agony, it's a lot easier to get there, I believe. Um, okay. So I kind of, I would look forward to working on my business. It was kind of an outlet for me. Um, so sometimes it was kind of like my thing, you know, it's like, you know, when somebody likes journaling or poetry or whatever, you know, when I was younger, I did like poetry and stuff like that. So this was kind of my creative outlet or my hobby. Um, so like I said, when you're in that position, when money is not the driving force. And for me, I'm, I never was like super, super after money. Um, yeah. I still am not like extremely materialistic but i understand what money can do and i like the things that it does for me and my loved ones um so i actually within two and a half years i i reached in total not for the year a million dollar business means that you're making a million in revenue each year or above okay. um i actually hit the 2.5 actually in, in 2.5 years so less than three years i did hit a million in sales in total and wow. that was pretty much, it wasn't a big team. Um, what I think I did differently from a lot of people was um, focus on, because my whole thing was to work less, I really prioritized. So I really zeroed in on what's working and I completely ditched the rest. And mm -hmm. that also meant, um, 
sorry, I'm losing my train of thought, but I was very focused on growing the business by prioritizing what was working and ditching what wasn't working. And another thing I did, which I felt like a lot of people didn't do, was I spoke to my customers a lot. I would engage with influencers. I would engage with my target audience. Um, and I would see what people actually want. I would always ask them, like, what do you want to see me carry? You know, what do you want Wall Street to carry? What do you want? Um, what, 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 what do you want that we don't have, you know? So I would always listen to the customers and I, it was, it was always about the people for me. It was, it wasn't about the numbers and I'm still not one of those like numbers people. I have to get help for that. I have somebody else who's looking at the numbers because I was never looking at the numbers. I was always looking at the people, making sure the people were happy, um, giving things away, um, and just when I would work with influencers, I wouldn't just, it wouldn't be a money transaction. I would build a relationship because there are women um, that I could relate to. And I actually enjoy, you know, collaborating and creating a win-win situation for one of the sisters and myself. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but. It, it does. And it, show, it shows humility as well, which I, is not um, surprising. I knew you were a very humble person um, to not focus on the money. And alhamdulillah, the money comes. I think that's something that we can take inspiration from as well, because as Muslims, you're not really supposed to be chasing the dunya, right? You're not supposed to be, mm -hmm. you know, after the bag at, at any cost, right? You're not supposed to be doing mm -hmm. that. You're supposed to be, like you said, doing real authentic work you're supposed to be engaging with your community you're filling a need mm -hmm. for hijab women that has a baraka in it so i think mm -hmm. that baraka is how you can like not focus on the money and the money grows how you can mm -hmm. give away products and see that mm -hmm. more customers come right 100%. that's like that's baraka when we give charity we're not supposed to say oh now i have ten dollars less you know now i'm ten dollars exactly. poorer you're supposed to not even worry about that $10 because some way, somehow Allah is going to replenish you from ways you don't even 100%. know and multiplied. So a hundred percent. So I, I, I really, really appreciate that you, you mentioned that. And, and I feel like you were ahead of your time. If this point was only about 2.5 years from the time you started in, you said 2014, um, where you are already super lucrative and it, it was through like engaging with the community and building relationships and things like that. I feel like there was a shift more recently in like 2020 and 20, you know, the pandemic and things like that, where people were like, let's stop being fake. Let's stop being aloof with our businesses. Let's stop like not replying to comments. Let's stop, you know, let's actually engage. And I feel like engagement became like something that people are, are, are pursuing more recently. But back then, it was a million comments that nobody's replying to. <laughs> the business mm -hmm. owner would never reply to it. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't just give you what they think is going to make money as opposed to what you're asking for. For example, um, we had a conversation with a plus size um, uh, hijab fashion you know, designer, and she's been doing this since all the way back then too. And she said that it was because it was her trying to engage with a community that was asking her for what they they want. Not everyone is going to be a size S, M, or L, you know? Um, and I think that that gave exactly. her butter as well. And she was listening to her community. And she's still one of the only ones doing that. Um, so I think you are well well ahead of your time to be looking at engagement and community, bu community building as opposed to, oh, I have this much followers and this is how much is in my bank. <laughs> exactly. You know what else, Hakima, I must bring up? I had diverse uh, models in terms of ethnicity. So not yeah. everybody was light um, yeah. skinned. And mm -hmm. that was... I didn't do that intentionally. It was natural because these are the people I grew up around. So I didn't think about it. It's just, that's what was natural. That's what it just is natural. Okay. Um, but then I remember when all the, the hijab companies started getting backlash for not doing this and then they all yeah. started doing it and it wasn't genuine. It was forced upon them. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I find that when you are genuine and you are real, People can see that, right? And they they resonate with it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, that that's so true. And when, you know, I think 2020 
was this kind of pressure cooker where people are like, it's either I make it, either my business makes it out of this pandemic or I'm 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 done for. Right. So you have to listen to what people have to say. And one of those things was a lot of these businesses were not doing the right thing by their community, by the lack of representation. And I could tell mm -hmm. that it was brands like yours that were just like, yeah, we've been doing this. It's natural to us. It comes naturally to represent our community. And there's an authenticity that you cannot come up with. You can't fake authenticity. It just, it oozes out of you. So um, yeah, I think I think that's a really good ob observation um, about that, that the skin color um, conversation that was that was back then. And now I, I think a lot of people are um, are baking that into their brand a lot more seamlessly. But back then it was a stark contrast. <laughs> but we will be back with Marwa to talk a little bit more about Thrive Entrepreneurship Academy when we come back after the break. <laughs> Welcome back to This Hijabi Life. Today, we've been talking to Marwa Adabdiri. She is the owner and founder of Wall Chic. And so far, we've only really been talking about Wall Chic and your journey with your hijab brand. But recently, you opened a, an academy to help small business owners focus on their businesses in the right ways and strategize and then scale their businesses to new heights. So can you talk a little bit more about Thrive Entrepreneurship Academy? Okay, so interestingly enough, it's something I've been wanting to do for years now, but I told myself I would not move on to anything else until it was a million dollar brand. So it was like, you got to stick, you know, stay the course, do your thing. And when you have, you know, a certain amount of help and the right amount of support, only then can you move on to doing this. And it's, it's one of those things that, just kept coming to me, to be honest with you. Um, part of it is because of what's happening in real life behind the scenes, which is as soon as women, other women are seeing my success, they're DMing me saying, you know, I have a business. Um, how do I do this? How do I do that? Or um, basically just asking for business advice. And yeah. um, you know me, I'm not a gatekeeper. So if someone's I asking... Do. I'm, I'm giving. Why? Because I believe in, you know, risk and, and, and blessings, they're abundant and they come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, if it's meant for you, it's going to be for you. If it's not, it's not. And everybody in this world, it, you're getting it either because Allah wants you to get it or because you put in the work to get it, or it's a combination of both. The point is you deserve it. So for me, if I see another sister, I know she's like me. She's a mother. She has a child to look after. She, she, why would I hold back five minutes of advice that could, you know, make a big difference in her life? Why would I do that? You know, yeah. we can, I can be good. She can be good. Um, so if it's a few minutes of, of my time, but it's going to save her a lot of money or it's going to allow her, you know, to make something easier for her or allow her to succeed in some way. I just don't believe in holding back. It just doesn't make sense. It's it's, it's more for her than it is taking away from me. Um, yeah. So throughout the years, I was always doing that kind of silently. And either someone would ask me or there's a sister I'm talking to who has a business and I'll see, you know, she's a really good person, but I could see an improvement. Like if she just adjusted her label slightly, she'd make more sales. And I know what to do. It's only going to take an hour of my time, but it's going to make a major difference in her business. So I would reach out and say, hey, depending on my relationship with her, as long as she wouldn't take it the wrong way, I would just offer some advice. So this is something that I enjoy doing um, because I really, really love entrepreneurship. I, I love the game. Like, I love it. I love mm -hmm. that you get to challenge yourself. And, you know, um, it's almost like when you, you know, when we were a kid, I, I played Nintendo 64, not a lot just one game. Um, mm -hmm. cause I, I just challenged myself. I wanted to pass the game. It wasn't my thing at all. 
Um, but for yeah. me, sometimes I, I view business as like a game, like there's levels and you, you challenge yourself. And once you pass that level, you, you, you challenge yourself and you, you go to the next level and you have to keep challenging yourself, like until you get to the top or wherever, you know, wherever you say, this is enough for me, wherever you yeah. feel fulfilled. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just asked you to talk a little bit more about the academy. So that's what you're doing. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. But oh, we were talking about why I even did this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why am I even doing this right now? Okay, so I love entrepreneurship, period. And mm -hmm. I, my parents were both teachers growing up. So this, I was around teachers my whole life. And mm -hmm. my mom would hire me for like $5. Uh, on Saturdays <laughs> to go in and teach with her. I was yeah. like nine years old. She was like, come with me to work. I'll give you yeah. $5. Just help me teach these little kids. They were like five and six year olds. And that was like, you know, one of my first jobs. I actually landed a real job when I was 14 and it was creating social programs for people. I've been creating social programs for people like my entire life. That was pretty much my whole thing um, for like social and economic development and inclusion. That was my background before um, Wall Chic. Um, so, um, teaching was in me, creating programs was in me. And now I could actually, I was actually qualified to teach business now. I'm like, I have the qualifications now, you yeah. know, yeah. and you know, it's crazy because I reflected and I realized when I was 14, I went on a trip to Egypt and I brought back hijabs and I tried to sell them to people at the masjid. I was like, I'm going to make money. I'm going to sell hijabs. Yeah. yeah. And then I couldn't sell it because they were my friends and people I knew. And every time they're like, how much is it? I'd be like, it's free. It's free. You know, <laughs> I just couldn't sell it. I would just give them all away from free. I'm like, you can't do business like this. So finally, when I did the <laughs> online thing, I'm like, good. No one knows me. I don't have to be shy and give things away for free anymore. Um, I yeah. can put whatever prices I want. I don't have to talk to people about the prices. The online thing where you don't see me, we don't have to talk. I just set the yeah. prices, you order or not. That was perfect for me. Another mm -hmm. thing, though, when I was 19 years old and I had this much business experience, zero, mm -hmm. I tried to create a program in my neighborhood to help people make money so they wouldn't what? do other things for money. Yeah. <laughs> They were doing wow. other things for money that weren't yet, yeah, but it was just yeah. part of the lifestyle. So I didn't, I was thinking, I'm like, why don't we just start businesses? Like I watch Shark Tank. People start businesses out here. Like there's other ways to make money. So I yeah. went to work and I printed out, I used the work printer. I printed out um, a business plan I found online. And I was like, guys, all of you come. I have an idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, we just need to fill out this business plan. <laughs> Wow. And then you can start wow. your own business. This was and 19 years old. I was 19 years old. Wow. And I actually got a group of people together and I said, I'm starting a business program. Um, and I didn't know anything about business, but I was like, you just have to fill out, fill out a business plan. You got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so now in life, you know, I'm 30 something. Um, we'll pretend I'm in my early 30s. Um, but. <laughs> Now I'm, I'm, I'm really doing it, but I actually have the knowledge and the experience. So, you know, I did tons of courses myself, tons of reading, the amount of I audio book read, the amount of books I was reading, I was doing like four books a month, um, yeah. going off of like zero before in my previous life before business. So yeah. I felt, I saw that entrepreneurship really challenged me as a person to become a better person. Like I went from not reading to reading all the time. But part of the reason I wasn't reading was because I was an audio reader, not a book mm -hmm. reader, but no one told me this. So entrepreneurship allowed me to, you know, learn different things about myself and like do things I've never done before, improve as a person so that I could improve my business. Um, yeah. So like I said, I really believe in entrepreneurship. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy the transformation when I see somebody has nothing and then within a few months they have an entire store where they're selling stuff and they're yeah. like I always wanted to do something like this but like I just didn't think I could but you know you inspired me you made me believe in myself and now I'm able to do all these things so the way I look at it is again it's not so much for me but that that 
not so much is unlocking somebody's potential. So you're not mm-hmm. making them, you're not creating everything for them, but you're just removing a barrier or you're giving them something they're missing. And that's unlocking a whole new world for them. And I, I, I truly genuinely enjoy that feeling. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about what the experience is like in your academy. Like if I sign up today to be a part of your academy, what am I getting from from you? Strategy, um, connections. Um, what what is it that the academy is like as, from our perspective as customers? OK, first things first, you're getting a piece of my heart, which is expensive. <laughs> <laughs> no, but all jokes aside, aside from that, um first things first you're getting a map you're getting a step-by-step strategy and you're getting what works and i'm leaving out everything that doesn't work and like i said this is off of 10 years of experience not only bullshit i've launched other businesses that worked Mm. using this step-by-step method um but i ditched them because they weren't my life's passion and i just can't spend my time doing things that aren't extremely meaningful to me and extremely impactful um if i don't view it that way at this point in my life it's not worth uh putting my time and energy towards it instead of you know my kids or my family or whatever um but the question again the question the question <laughs> what, 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 what would be our Wait, experience what so right when you go in, like the first day, you're meeting other sisters, you're part of a network. So I'm growing mm-hmm. a network. It's over 100 women right now. I'm trying to at least the, 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 the initial targets a 1000 women, where we're all on a portal, and you can reach out to anyone for anything. And I'm there to support people. But right now there's cohorts. So you enter with your cohort, and you go from place A to place B. And there's two cohorts. One is for like, I'm completely starting from scratch. Um, or I have an idea, or I have a business that's not working, you're in one group, or the other group is I have a business, it is working, I just want to scale, I want to grow my sales, and I want to scale, and I want to work less and make more. That's the second group. So let's just talk about the first group. Um, You come in, the the business plan is two pages. Mm -hmm. It's two pages, you have a business checklist, it's one page. And then we're working on your vision and your why what do you desire, you know, and why? And when you achieve what you desire in the way that you want, what is it going to do for your life? How's it going to enhance your life? How's it going to enhance your loved one's lives? lives? And you're really envisioning this transformation. Mm-hmm. And the key here is to not limit yourself. So this is what I get into immediately because everybody else, everybody is placing limitations, even me, myself. I'm going to be placing limitations on myself because we're a product of everything we've heard, learned, saw up until now. So in order to go beyond that, there needs to be some level of imagination, um, which is unrealistic. And our minds are programmed to keep us in check, to keep things realistic. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, It's like a safety net. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we start to drift off and start to, you know, imagine and I wish and I dream, it's kind of like come back to earth. It ain't happening. So there's Mm -hmm. a balance of both of those going on at the same time, though, there's delusion. Right. (laughs) We're not talking delusion here. We're talking dream plan vision so that you can unlock a whole new world of opportunity that you're currently blocking, even though you might not realize it. And then we're creating a realistic roadmap plan and strategy, which I already laid out, but part Mm -hmm. of it is part of you that needs to be injected in that process so that it's for you and not for the person next to you. So I kind of tried to combine what works in general, business strategies, principles, step-by-step blueprint plan. But part of the success is understanding yourself and taking those pieces of you and injecting it in that process to ensure that it is a success for you as well. And it's fulfilling you and what you truly want and creating the life that you want. So that's basically what you can expect. It's me mentoring you bi-weekly. I show up live. I talk to you like how I'm talking to you. You DM Mm -hmm. me anytime. I'm there for you. I answer all your questions, meet with other sisters. In between meeting with me, you have a, 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 a group of women who are holding you accountable. 
it just cut out. Um, you have a group of women that are holding you accountable, other entrepreneurs who are working on their business. Uh, yeah. So you have that support group even without me. Mashallah. It sounds like a really, really great program. So you said more than a, a, a hundred women, the goal being a thousand. Um, and how long has it, have you started? Like, when did it start? Yeah. So right now, at least 125 women about are enrolled. It started in February. Wow. That's incredible. That's incredible. Okay. So there's a couple of things that you mentioned as you responded just now. What I got out of it was, you know, kind of breaking away from a scarcity mindset. 100%. Um, and, and what I, what I think a lot of women, and I'm speaking generally about women, but not to stereotype women because men deal with the same types of things, but imposter syndrome. Um, you know, when, when you, when you talked about like imagining and, and being, and, you know, kind of unlocking your potential, you said, um, I think what holds people back from that is feeling that they don't deserve to be in the space that they're in. They have a really great product or the really great um, uh, idea that needs to be, you know, put into production or whatever it is, but they're not positioned in a place that they deserve to be in. Something makes them feel as if they're an imposter. They're they're speaking, but they, it doesn't feel like it's their words, <laughs> or they're they're not able to show up as their authentic selves, and 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 feel like they're worthy of being in that space. And I think if you if you take away the imposter syndrome, and I think like social media has really helped me personally with imposter syndrome. And I think, you know, a lot of people think that social media will do the very opposite, but social media has helped me because it's really just you against yourself, right? Like it's it. There's no crowd in front of you except for like the digital crowd, of course. But it's you and your phone. <laughs> it's you and your phone. So if you can get outside of your own way and just post go ahead and just post about whatever it is that is your um almost delusion but really it's just you trying to unlock your potential whatever you think is funny even if nobody else is like you think nobody else will la post it i'm gonna guarantee you some people are gonna laugh um some people are gonna find what you think uh, is useful as groundbreakingly useful not just useful but like you're so talented People will give you that feedback, but first you have to give yourself that feedback. You have to get outside of your own way. Um, so I think with that imposter syndrome breaking down, as well as the scarcity mindset breaking down, because there's something for everyone. Um, you said you do give, you've done giveaways, and you've not been um, not just with products, but you've been um, you haven't held back. You haven't been a a gatekeeper with information even before the academy that shows that your scarcity mindset is is it, there is no scarcity mindset with you and i think that that's where where you can really start to scale your business because there is literally something for everyone and as a muslim the concept of rizq and the then and the fact that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar razaq and you pray to him and you don't pray to anybody else then how could it be that you are limited in any way how could it possibly be that you have any exactly? Exactly. <laughs> so and, we do have to and, take. Go ahead. No, 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 no. Go ahead. No. We. I was gonna go to a short break, and then we're gonna wrap up mm -hmm. when we come back. And um, you know, you can say what you were gonna say at the very end here, and then we'll give our final words. Inshallah. For sure. So we'll be back after the break. Okay. Back to the show today we've been talking to the owner and founder of Walshik Marwa Adardiri and we were just talking about her entrepreneurship academy thrive entrepreneurship and you were going to mention something with regards to maybe imposter syndrome or scarcity mindset um I'll allow you to to respond to what I had said before the well, break. part of my research when I was on my entrepreneurship journey when I couldn't get past a certain amount 
Like I couldn't get past 2,500 a month in sales. And it was kind of like I had reached my limit. That's when I had to do some deep, deeper digging. And, and that's when I started to look into what allows people to make money. And the biggest part, the, the, the biggest barrier for me, and, and it's a barrier for many people, was the mindset. So there was like simple things. It was like people who are born into money or their parents are already making a lot of money. They, this is normal for them. So when they go in to uh, get a job, obviously it's like people they know, you know, not what you know, who you know, nepotism, all that stuff exists, but it's actually in their head. They think they deserve a certain amount of money. So mm -hmm. naturally you're going to go in that direction. So I realized I was like, I need to understand that I deserve certain things or that I can achieve certain things or that I'm worthy of certain things. And this is the whole thing why I love entrepreneurship so much because it's not separate from personal development and personal growth. So the, the mission of Thrive Entrepreneurship is to, um, to, to empower women through entrepreneurship by fostering personal growth um, and financial freedom. So that personal growth is, is a big part of it. Um, so I realized that I had to change as a person in order for my business to change. And then yeah. I started taking a lot of, you know, secular business advice and that was good for a long time, but then mm -hmm. it got to the point when you're trying to get past another level, I started to read and see things that I felt like their approach to teaching or their values started to really conflict with mine. Like, mm. you know, the creator of the Lord and you know, the Lord and the creator of the universe is not um, at the forefront. They're, you know, seeking other means and going through other avenues, even though it's very discreet um, because I have that basic, you know, strong knowledge in, in the basics of the religion. I was able to catch those things. So I actually yeah. took a break. I'm like, I'm not even going to try to, you know, try to make more money mentally before I can do it in real life. I'm just completely taking a break. Let me just start, you know, focusing on my Dean, focusing on me as a person, because I never want this to be a path that leads me astray. You know, this is a path that inshallah, I can do more good with it for myself and my family and for others. And this is something that we have to be conscious of. We have to constantly, you know, return back to our Lord because nothing is guaranteed. And so I shifted my mindset though. I don't need those things. At the end yeah. of the day, it's like what you said. If Allah says, ask, 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 and don't be shy, like I will keep giving. So that's key. Like what you can and limits on it when Allah is telling us there are no boundaries, there are no limits and yeah. that, you know, come to me and ask for more. And also, like you, like you mentioned, like risk is, is the, the abundance is unlimited. Yeah. So it's not that it's me or you. We can both have a lot. Who are mm -hmm. we to place a limit on the abundance? You know, it's 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 never ending on the abundance that Allah has given us or has given out. You know. So now I just always think to myself, it's not about anybody else. It hasn't been for a while everybody else is second but it's about me and it's about mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa and our relationship with each other and I always say who says I'm not worthy who says I I I cannot be in this space who says I can't have that it's going to be me or it's going to be Allah subhanahu wa ta and Allah didn't say that and yeah he's about <laughs> us so who am I to even say that about myself you yeah. get what I'm saying yeah, so definitely he's not def saying it I'm not saying, saying it, nobody's saying it to me. At the yeah. end of the day, it's just me and my Lord. And that's what it comes down to. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned values and that you, you, um, you mentioned Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we always, at the end of the show, you know, we talk about exciting things, entrepreneurship, making money, uh, designing. We talk about hijab journeys. We've talked about so much in the show. But at the end of the show, we always try to bring it back to Allah um, and through the show as well. But this final segment is always some kind of reminder that um, that our purpose in life is not anything more um, of the dunya than it is the akhirah. 
right? And the dunya is just a means towards the akhirah. So um, for your final wrap up, I do want to ask you, um, you know, to inspire the young generation, and I do mean the younger generation of Muslim um, entrepreneurs, how they can guide themselves towards success. That means success in this dunya that is halal success, but also it means success in the akhirah. It's not the dunya over the akhirah. Um, so what would be your advice to a young entrepreneur watching the show um, on how to prioritize their akhira in the pursuit of things that are, you know, lucrative in this dunya. Yeah, like you said, it's about prioritizing and it starts with intention. So, um, you know, we are told to ask, so you're not supposed to like, you know, you know, torture me, give me all my punishment in this world so I can escape it in the akhirah. No, we were told to ask for good in this world and good in the akhirah. But like you said, anything that's going to uh, compromise your akhirah or it's going to stop you from the akhirah, I mean, it's not worth it. It's like, yeah. you know, the drop of the ocean, the, 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 you know, the, what is it? The residue on your finger or a stick when you dip your finger in the ocean versus mm -hmm. the entire ocean logically if you are you know keeping that relationship you're not going to prioritize that residue of water on your finger when you dip it in the ocean over the entire ocean so you do just really need to check yourself um and like like business like working out in the gym like anything else in life if you're if you're going to go to the gym because you want to stay fit you're going to eat healthy um you're going to work on your business every day then we do, you know, alhamdulillah, we have the five prayers at the very least. Um, that needs to be a part of your daily routine because um, that's your, that's keeping you in check. That's yeah. you reminding yourself and, you know, putting yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiple times in the day. So just to keep that connection. Um, and like you said, business, success in the dunya is is a secondary, but know that in the deen, the upper hand is better than the lower hand, meaning mm -hmm. you don't want to be in a position of handouts and help me. You want to be in a position where you can help others. So it is part um, of, of, of what, what we're asked to do to actually strive to be better, um, yeah. to grow as people, you know, and, and money is just one part of those things. It's not everything. Um, money does solve some problems. Money allows you to do some things, but money is not going to remove the challenges in your life. And yeah. um, this is dunya. We're going to have challenges, and that's it's part of the test of life. We can always look to someone else who's going through something, you know, more trying than we're going through, and see that as a mercy. And we can also look at whatever we're facing and say, you know what? With every challenge, there's a lesson. There's an opportunity. You know, there's an opportunity. One door's closing, so another one can open. I'm going through this because there's something I need to learn. I'm going through this because maybe I've, you know, strayed away from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and He's bringing me back closer through this trial. Um, so to always see the positive, see the bright side, and, um, yeah, you know, turn lemons into lemonade. <laughs> I love that, Marwa. Thank you so much for that advice and for being here on the show. I really, really appreciate it, especially since I got the exclusive. No, she's never been interviewed before, so alhamdulillah. Um, Mr. Hakima is the first. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it here at Muslim Network TV. And um, for my final words, I'm going to piggyback off of what you mentioned. Um, there was, I remember a particular year, I think it was probably my third or fourth year in college, and I was pursuing a medical degree um, prior to all of this. And um, I was just, my head was in the books so heavy. I mean, from all day, all night, I'm just trying to memorize these like chemical equations and like all of this stuff. And I got so absorbed in my, um, in my schoolwork that I started to see that I was reading less Quran because there just literally was no time. <laughs> and um, alhamdulillah, my five daily prayers were always pretty rock solid, but um, there was other supplemental things that I was like, man, I'm reading all of these books, but I'm not reading the book of Allah. Um, and I remember a, a particular prayer um, and I recited uh, Surah Al-Kathir 
And I, I cried so much after that prayer. And I decided mm. at that moment that I'm, I can still pursue this degree, but I really do have to set aside time to for the remembrance of Allah in those ways mm -hmm. um, besides the five daily prayers um, that was already mm -hmm. just um, natural to me. And as Surah Al-Takathur, alhamdulillah, Allah mentions Al-Hakum Al-Takathur hatta zurtum al-maqabir kalla sofa ta'lamun. And I always remember those ayats um, and that that particular prayer when I broke down because um, it's talking about piling up the wealth in this dunya. And then when you meet your grave, then you will mm -hmm. finally actually know what reality is. Mm -hmm. And so many people in this dunya who don't have a, a guide for them, like we mm -hmm. do as Muslims, we have the Quran as our guide. Mm -hmm. um, and and our it's it's always something that we can go back to when we feel like we're getting astray and where we are pursuing the dunya over the akhirah. Mm -hmm. um, reading the Quran is always a reminder to come mm -hmm. back. So mm -hmm. I remember reading that that surah in that in that um, in that salah, and it really just was a stark realization that it's not medical school or nothing. It's not medical school or failure for me. It's not med It's not getting an A or else the C is unacceptable. <laughs> it's the pursuit of the dunya, but not at the expense of the akhirah. And that surah is so so short and so powerful that you know we don't know when we're going to pass away. And but when we do meet that dun that 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 um, that grave, it will be the real the reality will meet us there whether we're ready or not. So I'm so glad that um, Marwa is such a great um, uh, example for that because you can have success in this dunya. But as you can tell throughout this interview, there was a lot of humility there. There was a lot of showing that you can do charity work. You cannot gatekeep. You cannot have a scarcity mindset where it's all, all for me and none for anybody else. Um, these are not just tenants of a great businesswoman and a great community, you know, guide, but it's a great, it's a great Muslim, inshallah. And these are the things that our deen has taught us in, in, and it's in the Quran if we only go back and we remind ourselves. So I wanna thank you guys for watching the show this week. It's been powerful on many levels. And as usual, this hijabi life always has a great interview and a great guest. Uh, so tune in next week when we'll be talking to another great person from the community about Muslim women, our um, journeys with hijab and entrepreneurship and the modern world. So thank you for watching and stay blessed and covered beautifully. Mm -hmm.